Hello, Syngap land. Today is Friday, April 1st, and this is episode 54 of Syngap 10. 1,055. 1,055. That's how many patients we have counted here on Earth. It's a massively important number. It's important because now we've found those patients. We got to connect them with each other and strengthen this community. And it's important because we got to tell industry, yo, 336 patients in the US, 115 patients in the UK, 83 patients in France, 81 patients in Germany, 55 patients in China, 38 patients in... I'm not sure which country that is. 32 patients. Because I'm looking, we have this cool tweet where we put out all the maps and we put the numbers next to the countries. So I'll stop when I don't know the, the flags anymore. But that's important news. It's telling industry, yes, there are patients here. Yes, there's a market here. Come and invest and treat our kids. So the Syngap census is a tremendous amount of work. Jess Duggan leads that ably. I thank you, Jess, and thank you to all our global partners in Europe and elsewhere who send us those numbers, track their patients, give us updates. It's This is a, a great sign of collaboration. So look for that tweet, hashtag Syngap Census, if you want to read the article. Amazing stuff. It's also in the show notes. Industry news. Two really important uh, pieces of news hit the wire this week that affect our patients. So the first is Fintepla has been approved for LGS patients. So that might sound like Greek, but we have a monogenic epilepsy. We have Syngap-1, which is a club we belong to because we know we have a type 1 Syngap-1. But there's also syndromes, right? And one of them is LGS. And LGS uh, patients have a certain kind of seizures per the EEG. And, and they have mul- and, and Syngap patients have LGS and other types of patients have LGS, Dravet's, et cetera. And um, so generally speaking, our patients with more severe seizures get an LGS diagnosis. And as a result of getting an LGS diagnosis, then you you are able to access and have insurance pay for certain other medicines. Very popular is Epidiolex. Well, Fintepla just joined that list. And I don't have time to tell you the whole Fintepla story, but it's it's an it's an epic story. It's, it's kind of cool actually. If you if you if you go to it, read the Wikipedia history, this drug's been around for a long time. Um, for it was it was fenfluramine. It was taken off the market decades ago, and then and then these guys in Brussels noticed that it was it was actually helping seizure patients, and then it was fenfen and blah blah blah. Long story short, it's been quasi miraculous for some patients with Dravet, and I, whose families I know. And um, the good news is it's a very powerful anti seizure drug. The bad news is it, it was originally a drug used for appetite suppression. So. Um, to get our kids to stop seizing, sometimes it also affects appetites. So you'd have to go down, you know, maybe the feeding tube route. But still, for our patients with severe seizures, if you have an LGS diagnosis, talk to your doctor about Fintepla. It's it's a very potent drug. And, and if your doctor agrees, maybe it's something that you should be looking into. The other big news was that Tevered, which is a company who we, we, we badger and we repeatedly send them emails and say, hey, we know you're working on Dre, but you've got really cool technology. Please work on Syngap. Um, Tever just licensed another technology from the laboratory of Professor Jeff Collar at Johns Hopkins University. This is great progress because the the tech that Tever is working on could be helpful for Syngap. So, you know, there's certain technologies that are gene specific, right? We're working on this alternate splice side on this gene, whatever. So some technologies are built for Syngap, but there are some technologies that can affect certain kinds of mutations. And, and that's what Tevard's working on. So there's a, some subset of our population where Tevard's tech will eventually be able to help Syngapians as long as we keep bugging them and reminding them they should be working on us. So congratulations to Tevard and Professor Collar for that licensing agreement. And please work on Syngap 1 one day. But these are two pieces of news that I thought were really great. Also, in the, also on the wire this week, uh, SRF announced that we co-funded with the Canadian Rare Disease um, Models and Mechanisms Network uh, two animal models in Canada. So really exciting. They called us up. I think I mentioned this before. They, they called us up and said, hey, we, we want to fund some Syngap work. Would you co-fund? Which means our dollars get doubled. And we said, sure, let's do it. So now you got two labs, the lab of Dr. Haas, who's looked at missense mutants, and the lab of um, Dr. Graziella Di Cristo, um, also building a model for Syngap 1, which is sort of, models are how it's done. Models are how it's done. You know, you, you there's, you can't test these technologies. You can't test the stuff that Tevert is doing if you don't have models to test it in. And and models generally means mice, but not always. There's also rats. Speaking of that, which um, we, we have decided that there's a couple of mice that don't exist. And I want to thank Julie Miles for continuing to work with us and JR and others um, on looking. We've identified some mutations we want to do in mice. And we're, we're looking to make, make a couple more mice so that different industry and academic partners can test certain technologies in those mice. How cool is that? 
How cool is that? So thank you, Julie. And it's all about, it's all about the models. Um, let's zoom out for a second. Let's go global. I want to, I want to recognize that um, Vicky Artiaga, who leads SYNGAP Latin America from Florida, flew to Spain this week to go to a Dreve conference. And there's a cool picture of her in Madrid meeting one of our families with, with Katrine, who flew down from the Netherlands to go to the same conference and connect with Victoria. So just wonderful to see like the different arms of SRF connecting around the world. And these, these real leaders, Katrine and Vicky are in the truest sense of the word leaders. They are people who saw something that wasn't happening. And instead of saying, hey, somebody should fix this, they fixed it, right? Vicky said, Mike, it's great what we're doing in the US, but we need to do it in Latin America. And then she just did it. And Katrine went to, was in the UK and said, we need SRF UK and created SRF UK. And then Katrine uh, moved to the Netherlands and said, well, there's no SRF EU and she's building that. So these are two of my heroes. And it was awesome to see them in the same photo with yet another Singaf family this week. So good job team. Um, by the way, by the way, if you remember in episode 48, I took about a minute to, to go off on ICD codes and I had two points. One of them was the CDC is being totally ridiculous about ICD codes. And I see a lot of rare disease friends really struggling. And I, and I made the point that I think it is beyond a joke at this point. And I, I'm encouraging all my rare disease friends who are in this doom loop right now to simply file a lawsuit because what the CDC is doing is essentially discriminating against people with disabilities. I still think that's the right answer and I'm going to hold to it. But it was cool that I put that in episode 48 because I got the call again. And in episode 48, I said, once a month, I get this call. So I just got the call, another group. Hey, Mike, we want an ICD code. We don't understand how to do it. Can you please help us? And I was like, go watch that episode and go read these articles. And then if you still have questions, call me back. Um, we'll see if they call me back. But related to ICD codes, I got to tell you, I had a couple meetings this week with healthcare economics companies. So we're really focused on when these genetic therapies come. And this is, you know, two, three, four years away. When these genetic therapies arrive, what are they going to cost? And this is such a going to be a very critical conversation that I don't think enough people are thinking about right now. And the way you want the way you one of the ways you justify the price of a therapy to the payer, which will be the insurance or the Medicare or the whomever, or the VA, um, is you show how much these kids cost without interventions. And the way you do that is you go into claims data. And the way you find Syngapians in the claims data, good luck with that if you don't use the ICD code. So I will just use this moment to remind everybody, F78.A1, get a tattoo, put it somewhere on your wrist, on whatever, put it somewhere, F78.A1, and make sure when you see a clinician or you get a bill, that bill includes F78.A1, because as soon as it's in your patient's record, then we can figure out what that patient costs. It's, it's so important, and uh, I'll just keep letting you know when I get these calls, because unfortunately, there's a lot of people in this doom loop with the CDC right now, and we got so lucky to get this code and now it's our job to use it because it would be a crime to have this code and not make full use of it so every family has a, has a responsibility f78.81 make sure it's getting on your bills great news by the way uh i've mentioned probably genetic and i just want to leave you with two points on probably genetic first a thousand a thousand people have already taken this survey Actually, three points. A thousand people have taken this survey, number one. Number two, we found, four, we found 40 families who, based on their answers to that survey, we're emailing them and we're saying, hey, could you please um, get a genetic test? Like, based on your answers, they, those answers felt a lot like Syngap answers. That's pretty cool. And just to be clear, we're not, we didn't make that up. We're like, let's just ask some questions. No, no, no. Probably genetic. This is their business, right? They have a, uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning, and they've done this for other diseases, and pharma pays them to do this for other diseases. And we were just really lucky to get a connection with them. And we, we, we funded just the creation of the link and, um, and the survey. And so now we get a monthly update from them about, okay, here's who's taken it. And here are the people who scored high. Maybe you should contact them. It's super exciting. And I've had families reach out to me and say, you know, I met this mom or this kid on the playground or this kid in my kid's school and they kind of look Syngapian and I don't know what to do. Here's the answer. You walk up to them and you write down syngap.fund slash maybe. Syngap.fund slash maybe. And that link will take them to the questionnaire. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, Go ahead and type syngap.fun slash maybe into a browser. If you've got a kid who is or isn't Syngapian, if they are Syngapian, click that. There's a question. Do they have a Syngap diagnosis? Click it, and then that will improve our AI. And if your kid doesn't have a Syngap diagnosis and you're watching this, just, just take it anyway. And for our other friends in rare disease, same answer. Check this out. It's a really cool platform, and I, and I think it's going to become popular. I want to talk about uh, advice. It's been a long week. 
I want to talk about advice. I've, I've had this conversation with a couple of different parents in a couple of different contexts. And I just want to say this for the record uh, to everybody. First piece of advice is build your team, right? There's a strong temptation when you're first diagnosed to just get into a family cuddle and be like, oh, let's hang on. This is not a hang on situation. This is not a hang on situation. This is an open the doors, open the windows, run outside and tell everybody situation. And then I've heard people say to me, I've had this conversation with three families and I think about it this week. I've had people say to me, well, we're waiting for things, the dust to settle so we can understand what's going on. Bad news. The dust really doesn't settle. The, the, the crazy keeps coming in different forms and different times. And none of us can do this alone. I've said this before. None of us can do this alone. So build team your kid. When you get diagnosed, if you haven't systematically reached out to your school, to your friends, to your neighbors, to your church, to your meditation group, to your whatever you do, wherever you go and interact with humans, which I realize we don't do enough these days in COVID. But whatever you define as community, you need to tell them, my kid has SYNCAP1, it's a big deal. I, I, I need you to understand about this. And if you have the bandwidth to help, I'd love your help. And here's why. Our kids don't get smaller and they don't get simpler. And the more people who you encourage to invest in your beloved Singapi and now, the more allies you will have as things continue to get complicated. Right? So that's just a, a broad piece of advice. Don't wait for the smoke to clear. Just let people know right now, oh boy, this is big and I need your help. And then the other spe specific piece of tactical information, I've had a few parents call me and be like, Mike, you know, I've got a pretty good neuro locally and I'm trying to figure out if I really need to go and see a regional neuro. So if you're seeing like a regional expert, like if you're seeing Dr. Paduri at Boston Children's, or you're seeing Dr. Davinsky at NYU, or you're seeing uh, Dr. Perry at Fort Worth, stop listening to this part. But most of us aren't seeing experts at major medical centers, right? Most of us live next to, you know, in places where there's just a neurologist who's working and, and the major medical center is a few hours away. And my advice to, to most of us then is definitely find a good neuro and have that person on your team and teach that person about Syngap. They need to be ex experts on Syngap. If, if, if you end up in the ER with your Syngapian, th that resident's not going to be able to spell Syngap nor is the fellow, nor is the attending. Like you're gonna need to be like, call my neurologist right now. This child has a rare disease. You, you, you don't have time to Google it, call the neuro. You need a local neuro who knows the local medical community, absolutely. And I would advise people to at least once a year, go and be seen at a major medical center. And I'm talking about NYU, Duke, Boston Children's, Stanford, UCSF, Cook Children's, like five, uh, Cincinnati, Colorado, like UCLA, like find a major medical center and make sure you go there once a year. And people are like, dude, I need a, an extra trip once a year. Like I need a hole in the head. Why is that a good idea? Here's why that's a good idea. First of all, second opinions never hurt. Second of all, this person's at a regional center. They're going to see more patients than your neurologist. And they might have insights. And by seeing your patient, they're deepening an understanding of Syngap. Who knows? It could lead to some cool research. And here's the punchline. When these companies who we are stalking and bugging and sending chocolates to do have a therapy and do launch clinical trials, they are not going to look in for local neighborhood neurologists. They're going to call a handful of major medical centers and say, how many Syngap patients do you see? First of all, we want that number to be as big as possible. Second of all, as soon as they then set up a trial at Boston Children's, at NYU, at, say, at Le Bonheur, at... Duke, at wherever, Stanford, I keep leaving out my own institution. Um, that institution is going to call the people who they already have in the system. So you got to play the short game, have a good local neurologist. And you got to play the long game, make sure you're plugged into the regional medical center. There, I've said it. Uh, okay, I've, I've run over, but that was important. I just want to remind you that in the last episode, episode 53, so if you, these old episodes, just Google uh, hashtag S10E53 for Syngap 10, episode 53. Uh, you can go, if you haven't listened to that, you must listen to that because in that episode, I go through all of the old, all of the events for the year and there's a lot of good stuff coming, but I was specifically want to underscore 
Next week, on Wednesday, April 6th, we have this webinar with the mom, Jackie, about severe behaviors in adolescence. I don't care how close or far you are from adolescence, I think it's going to be an amazing webinar. At the end of this month, April, we have a webinar with Dr. Anderson. We're going to be pushing out a press release on that. Thank you, Joe. Um, soon, but you want to go to that webinar. That's some pretty cool science. And then reminder, end of this month, we are now in April, Sprint for Syngap, April 30th. This is our spring fundraiser. This is a chance for you to reach out to your community, tell people about Syngap, raise some money, because all this work is um, costs money. And we got to work together to improve our loved one's future. So Sprint for Syngap, syngap.fund slash Sprint 2022. Thank you so much for listening. This is a podcast. Make sure you subscribe and we'll talk to you soon.